Hey, what's up, Emmanuel? Welcome from Naples, Florida. Pastor Johnson and I are, are enjoying just a little slice of time on the beach today. You can see the ocean in the background. And we wanted to come to you to share a little bit about the scripture passage that you're going to hear today uh, in service. Hey, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings to you from Naples. Why we are here, that's, uh, it's very important for you to know that uh, we are talking uh, with uh, another organization and a church which offers um, a flexible way of equipping and training uh, church leaders, uh, whether it is a bridge program for a high school person to uh, take some college credit or somebody want to do a theological education master level or somebody want to explore a doctoral uh, study. So um, we uh, are trying to bring those programs to our place, uh, to do it from our place. We are in a very preliminary conversation of that. That's the reason we are here in Naples. But when we were here, we thought of just coming and sharing today's pericope with you. As you heard the reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, that Jesus talks about parable of a rich fool. Look at that, rich fool. I just wanted to unmask that. All rich people are not fool. All poor people are not uh, uh, brave or vice versa. So you should not really take it up from that word that being rich is not good in the kingdom of God. I just wanted to say it is incorrect way of doing that. But at the same time, the priorities is what matters there. What do you think, Pastor Sean? Yeah, I think uh, you, what you heard in that parable, that story, there was a purpose behind it. Jesus telling that parable was to help us see that life is about more than just abundance. So the issue is not the things that we have or the wealth that we have, because we all, really, all of us are very wealthy people. And if you, contextually, if you apply that to the world, we're very wealthy people. Uh, in the top percents of the world, we are, you and I. So, so the, the issue isn't so much the wealth, the issue is the uh, desire for more and the uh, living for self and the clinging tightly to the things of this world. And so if you notice in the story, it's interesting because um, this, this uh, it, Jesus tells the story and the man is always, he's talking to himself. You hear it the way he reflects, he asks himself, what shall I do? I know what I will do. I'll build these bigger barns. So he's so self-absorbed that his, he's clinging tightly, um, not just to his stuff, but even not including others in his thoughts about how he uses what God has given him. The, the interesting part in that is, uh, if you, uh, the, 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 the first guy who went to Jesus and said, hey, tell my brother to share his uh, wealth with me or, or something like that. And Jesus is telling him, hey, don't make me a judge and arbitrator. The reason is that people completely misunderstand who Jesus is. Jesus is a savior, not a judge. He not made, He does not make judgments upon us. He's a savior and his saving grace is still coming to you and me irrespective of your economic status or uh, your uh, whatever your uh, beliefs and things like that. But his constant saving grace is for everyone and everybody. So we are doing this from Naples, uh, from one of the very wealthy neighborhoods or the wealthiest counties in the United States, if I put that way. Just uh, before me, you will see uh, a lot of uh, luxurious buildings and stuff like that. I was told people come and rent these places for three months for $60,000. And uh, that is, uh, if they have it, and that's all okay. But the important thing, all of that is, what is the generosity in their life? I just wanted to give a quote. I do not know where I picked up the quote, but I want to read it so that I don't miss that. Miser and miserable are from the same root word. Anytime I'm giving money away, I am breaking the grip of coveting in my life. 
So that's what it matters. That's what Jesus was trying to tell through the parable. Because the guy was thinking, he's making a lot of money, he's, he's making a lot of uh, 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 produce, and uh, he has no intention of sharing that. He said, I'm going to make a big bond and expanding that. It's all about so selfishness or in another way, we can call it as a narcissistic way of life. That's what Jesus was telling. No, you remember that whatever you have, if your soul is called back, you cannot enjoy that. So it is an opportunity for us to share the things. What do you think? Yeah, so the, you noticed in the text that at the very start it says Jesus tells a story and he says that the abundance came from the ground. And I think that's an important factor is that uh, the abundance, he didn't say the abundance came from the, the hard work of the man. He came, the abundance came from the ground. In other words, everything we have is gift from God. It comes from him. It comes from the ground in this case. And so, but the man attributes, uh, he doesn't even seem to factor that in. He doesn't seem to want to be interested in sharing. What about all his workers? What about all those people who care for the field? Instead, his only concern is how do I save more for myself? And uh, so, but God wants us to be generous because ultimately it comes from him. He wants us to be generous, but why do we cling so tightly? It's a great story, right? Why did Jesus tell it otherwise? Generous in, generous, generous in the context is not only that uh, God wants to open up your wallet or, or something like that. It is just your time and your smile, um, your availability to whatever way it can be. That is what God is teaching you, my friends, today through this uh, beautiful, beautiful parable. And uh, also, uh, I just want to remind you, the ninth commandment, I'll read it. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that... We do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. That is the small catechism definition of it. Recently, I came across a wonderful book, Eighth Day Discipleship, A New Vision for Faith, Work and Economics. A friend of mine, Reverend Dr. Richard Bleas, wrote this book. It talks about the importance of being Christ's disciple and he uses Luther's small catechism and his explanation and he adds, Richard adds a commentary called Faith Works Economics Commentary on the Commandment and the Catechism. Here he writes on the ninth, category, ninth, ninth commandment, ninth commandment, as you know, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does it mean? Let's go. This commandment is one of the pillars of any free market economic system that works. Protecting private property promotes freedom and economic prosperity within a society. A family or business can only build equity and worth if homes and property are protected by laws. Schemes that trample on those rights are prohibited in this commandment. The same holds true for business competitors also. The basis for any free market where families and businesses thrive is the respect for and execution of this ninth commandment. What a profound truth here. Life is not immortal, but it is very, very mortal and temporary and transient. In the midst of that, God tells that, hey, it's okay. I'm not telling you, you should not uh, be uh, saving money for your retirement. We do need that. We need it diligent. And God says that. And even many financial advisors suggest that we should have at least six months of our earnings to really keep us as an emergency thing. I wish you all have the preparation. That's all very important. Get me right. But at the same time, everything is transient and transparent. So, and a and, uh, few, few Christmases ago, there was a church, a, a pastor uh, sent, uh, offered uh, $2,000 to our church and uh, to give it away, give it away. 
So I gave $100 to 20 people. And those 20 people doubled those money and shared with people who are in need during the time of Christmas, three years ago. That is, that is what generosity, an example of it. And uh, this is what God is teaching you and me. What do you think, Pastor? Yeah, Sam? I think, uh, you know, we're, we're just, you see, we're standing, literally standing in the water here. <laughs> And uh, I think about, I feel the sand moving through my toes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and so as we think about that, thing, how it's, the, you heard from the Old Testament reading in Ecclesiastes, how it's just but a mist, you know, life is but a mist or a vapor. And so it's it, the sand moving through our toes, every grain of sand just keeps moving. Our time is short, really. And so why we cling so tightly? Natural human tendency, cling tightly to things in this world, but Jesus has in mind something different for us, the eternal things. And so that frees us up to be generous people. Generous, as Pastor Johnson said, it's not about, it's not about the money. People always mishear that. It's not about the money. It's about the heart. That's what God cares about, about your heart. That you're generous with your time, with other people, how you invest in others. No greater investment than investing in someone else. And that's the other interesting thing about being here is we're talking about how do we invest in people, in pastors, through different training. The other, the other interesting part about how, why we're here in Florida, sharing some of our time off so that we can talk about how do we equip more pastors. Be generous with the things that God gives you. In Luke chapter 12, verse 21, I just want to read. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Think about this, how God is so generous. When you see this massive water and everything belongs to him and letting us to enjoy it for ourselves. Not only that, he expects us to replicate that as well in whatever way we can whether we protect the environment and support uh, the the ecosystem the ecology of things and uh, this is very very important but here the scripture says the guy was not rich toward god and the contrary god has been rich towards us by generously giving this so in the later part of luke that is where the two sons we call prodigal son story. When the abundance was split and shared between brothers, you know what the brother did, right? So that's what God was telling, using in a right way. That's what God calls, particularly in the Christian understanding of life. Life itself is an expression of stewardship, serving, available. And even when you say a prayer for someone else, supporting one someone else, like the Good Samaritan story a few weeks ago, that's all tying in together in the parable of the rich fool. Being rich is not a problem, but being a fool of not rightly investing in the time and space and the resources towards the fellow human beings and God and God's creation is wrong. Well, this is the first time that we've uh, delivered a sermon in the standing in the ocean. So that's a first. But uh, but as you receive the word today, our prayer is that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, fill your hearts and minds today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God be with you.